asked at Gallery Arc one time, you said that it seemed like I was afraid to talk to you, and I am afraid to talk to you many <laughs> times. <laughs> Make sure the red light is always on. Mm. Make sure the sound is good and make sure this doesn't start oh. sagging. Hello, this is Wazwo X Wazwo Evil O from Baroda, and I'm sitting here today with none other than a Padma Shri winner, a Padma Bhushan winner, Mr. Gulab Muhammad Sheikh. One of the most prestigious artists in India, I would say. I'm so honored to be here. Good morning, Gula Muhammad. How are you? I'm, I'm well and welcome. Welcome to Baroda. Thank you. And you're trying to stay very safe with our masks. So yeah. we're talking <laughs> in this direction today. Okay. So we're going to start this off. I just want to say that I love your painting, of course. You we're painting, I think you had your first exhibition in the 1960s, if I remember 61, right. 61, yeah. Yeah, at Jahangir Nicholson. Jahangir Art Gallery. Jahangir Art Gallery. And you read a poem, I read. You read no, a poem. Hussein came and opened the exhibition. I'm a Hussein. And he read his poem for opening the exhibition. Oh, he read his poem? Yeah. Oh, okay, but you didn't have a poem of your own. No, I didn't. I had my paintings there. Okay. But you were friends with Bupin Cocker, the late Bupin yeah. Cocker. Very close to him. Bupin came to Baroda the same year. And uh, he joined the uh, Department of Artistry to do a master's in art criticism. Because he did not wish to begin from the beginning. And he had already got a Bachelor of Arts degree, a Bachelor of Commerce degree. So with that degree, he was allowed to join a master's course. But he joined that year, 61. I remember Bupin was an accountant originally, right? Yes, he was an accountant. Yes, yeah. yes. And then he took an interest in art. But <laughs> I love your paintings and there's so much to discuss because you have such a long history. Um, you're generally associated, I believe, with the Baroda narrative school. And when I look at your paintings, you see all of these. One thing I see in your paintings many times is you sort of compartmentalize with little rooms and things are happening in rooms or things are happening like on a map and different mm -hmm. areas of the map are showing different things. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that narrative approach to painting? Ah, uh, <laughs> but it's a long story, you know, to cut it short. <clears throat> we have a lot of time. What interested me was the multiple. In the sense that if you are, let's say, painting a place, then I would like to show both inside and outside of the place, which is otherwise not possible. And that's what began in sometime, sometime around 1970s. And I began to experiment with bringing in as many images as possible within a, a frame. So that becomes a kind of a story, which you can read from left to right, right to left, bottom upwards, from top to bottom, whichever way do you like and you can exit. So, and also you enter into the image. So there is multiple in the sense that you have multiple situations. Not only just multiple situations, but also there are multiple ways of looking at it. Because you can combine number one and number three, number two and number four, whichever way you like. And you keep on reading and that you can even make your own story about uh, whatever the painting represents. I think that is how it began. Compartments were only required when I did something like a building, let's say, and if I want to show 
the inside of this room, outside of that room, I want to show a third room or a fourth room. Or if I want to, let's say, paint a street, then I want to show this house and I want to show that house. So I want to open the, some part of this house. I want to open some part of that house. In that sense, you can keep on opening places and letting the viewer at, enter them. And this is how the story began. So narrative in that sense is both a narrative that I sort of concoct. But at the same time, the viewer can also make his own narrative. He can read and connect whichever way that he or she may like. So this is something, for me it was different because we were used to making a singular image. Most of my predecessors, you know, were sort of more, what you call, classical modern. Classical modernists, yes. In the sense that they used one image within a painting. And that would be between the four corners of the canvas. I wanted to open that canvas. I wanted to enter that canvas. I wanted to, let's say, even make the restriction of the borders, you know, a little more fluid so that you can move into the canvas or from situation to situation, from place to place, from person to person. And I had noticed that, not exactly in the same manner, but in a similar way, when I was teaching and I began to look at Indian painting, particularly around 1970s, it was my first foray in teaching Indian painting. Earlier, I had no opportunity to teach Indian painting. And I saw that in, particularly in Mughal painting, let me give you an example of Akbar observing the building of the city of Fatehpur Sikri. <clears throat> now, if you begin at the bottom, you see some people, figures, and the workmen. If you go upward, you see more workmen. If you go further, then you will see a building being constructed. If you go in the middle, then you find that Akbar is instructing somebody. Now, most interesting part was that the figure of Akbar, which is at the top, and the figure of the workman, which is at the bottom, there was no difference in sizes. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody was given prominence by so there is them no larger. linear perspective. Right. So you have the whole landscape as though it is lifted up, you know, in front of you. So each one comes close to your eye, mm. and as though you are talking to each one of them. So each one looks identically of the same size. And I thought that this is a very interesting way of let's say, moving into a painting, in the sense that perhaps artists wanted us to move from one figure to another, and each one you face, each one you don't see his back. You don't see him becoming smaller, you don't see him disappearing into distance. Each one comes to you, so it is, moment is not backward inside, but the moment is toward you. So that you can literally see each one of you, each one of them, individually. That's why. So I, I thought that I would use that idea into my painting. That's why I equate much of what you do with the miniature painting tradition also, because it was the same thing. There wasn't that perspective. Everything was sort of on different overlapping planes, yeah. but the sizes were the same. Is it okay? Oh, you're doing very good. I think. Okay. <laughs> so I want to get into your map paintings. You had a whole series of paintings where you were doing maps, and they're a little different than the compartmentalization in buildings and in a city. Do you want to talk how you got into the map paintings at all? Well, in a way, it is uh, walking further. As there was sort of a walk inside the Mughal painting, 
I also kind of a, created some kind of a walk that individual viewer walks into the work, into from sort of place to place, from one room to another room. Or if it is an open landscape, then one can move from one to the other. And that, as I said, that the, the ground is lifted up. But actually, it doesn't become flat. You still have, you know, whatever space or whatever dimension or whatever depth that is visible. Now, when I came across this map and I began to make maps, I thought that this is an extension of what I was doing. In a way, I was extending, like a map is something which is on the same plane, same level. Whether it is Delhi or it is Udaipur or it is Baroda. You know, if you look at the map, it's at the same level. So I want to extend the idea of entering from one place to another place. Second thing what I tried to introduce in the map, I used a map, that means it was a Mappa Mundi called Epstop Mappa Mundi. You can change the map like you erase a border yeah. and just make a kind of a fluid space from one area to another. So you enter from another one territory into another without facing a border. Right. And so you go on making your own maps. And in a sort of, in a way, you are also walking. You are moving from place to place. So basically it's not a terribly different thing than and, what I was and, doing. And the map also were part of miniature traditions sometimes like there are miniatures from Natwara that show yes, yes. the maps of Natwara and one thing I really love about those miniatures is uh, you know you don't necessarily have an up and a down a north and a south it's sort of like yeah. you're looking at things from <laughs> exactly. different perspectives all the way ah. through and you sort of do the same thing I think with your maps. Well in a way it was a learning experience at the same time exploring new spaces. Now what does an artist do finally? You know, if you were in your mind, imagine that you would be there. Here it's a map in which you actually enter. You know, so your imagination in that sense take, uh, takes a visual form. And in that you keep on moving from... And let me tell you, I have a kind of a... In, in Gujarati, we call it, we have a chakkardu in our, my feet. That means that I am, I have a wanderlust. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I keep moving. I like to move. And secondly, I like to move with my feet. I have walked everywhere, wherever I go. I have walked, even in Europe when I hitchhiked. I walked a lot. And I discovered all the townships and cities with my feet because when you go walking, you can see so many things. You see so much more when you walk. I used to walk a lot, I don't much anymore. But in my walking days, I just loved it so much because you see things, you just zoom by in a taxi yeah. or a car, you don't, you miss 90% yeah. of it, you miss. And when you walk, you're just like, oh, wow, look at the flowers, you know. Um, and you stop wherever you want to stop. You may sit down and see something. You may perhaps change course instead of taking this street, take that street. I would keep a map in my hand if I were moving in Paris or Florence. I know that I can go there and I'll find my destination. But suppose if I want to go, if I have a map in my hand and i going this para pia, what is it called? Piazza Signoria and then you want to go from here. But also there is a way of going like this. I said, right. why not? So you see, this is a kind of a human desire to explore, to discover. Right. So map would allow you to discover because actually, physically, in your own life, you 
continue to discover. And so many times the most beautiful routes are the routes that are not the direct routes. They're the meandering routes, yeah. you know. Those are the exactly. ones that are the most beautiful, you know. Exactly, see. exactly. I want to say one thing about your paintings, and that's about your color palette, because I feel most of the time, not always, I can spot a Gula Muhammad Sheikh on a wall from 60 feet away. It's like <laughs> I know it's one of yours because of your color palette, because you use oftentimes these fiery reds and blood reds and you juxtapose them with these really dark greens and yet at the same time there's something sort of fluorescent about some of the colors and do you want to talk about your color palette at all does that just come naturally or is there a reason you use those colors or no as far as i'm concerned when i paint i just it comes to my, my mind that's all and when I do my painting, I then get out of my painting and think about it. So these are the thoughts that are collected after that. But also the thoughts that I had about looking at Indian, what you call miniature painting. For instance, if I look at the Mewad painting, palette of Mewad painting, and you see the deep red, also on the borders, but also within. Yeah. Sometimes the ground is red, yes. no, bright red. Sometimes you find that yellow, and it is blazing yellow, you know. It's purely from that yellow, that is extract from the, the cow urine, urine of the cow. The cow urine that are fed mango. And you have blues and you have reds, etc. But, so I began to ask myself the question, how do they, why do they use this color? One thing that came to my mind was that it was not color, it was not a scheme according to spectrum. You know, like you have this whatever colors and then you have red, blue, green, etc. Not that. I began to think that color is associated with visual and sensuous qualities of looking, knowing. For instance, if it is red, what is red? You know, that deep or bright red. And I would, and somebody would say that, okay, if you use red, it's color of blood. But that is a very descriptive and very narrow way of looking at it. Yes. Now, if you see red, then you see there is that little insect that comes out in uh, Monsoon, it's that bright. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you see some other objects in, you know, uh, even like for instance, even in textile, you know, when women, why do they use that very bright red? Mm -hmm. They have that deep, they, there's a, a kind of a deep sense of color which is embedded in the life of people. It's not something which come from outside. No, it's from living. Right. And they have discovered that this is the color best suited to them. Then I began to think if it is, let's say for instance, I saw this painting, very famous painting of Ram chasing a golden deer, you know. And I saw that the Sita color of the, the golden deer? that is a Kulu, a Mandi painting. Okay. It's in National Museum okay. in Delhi. And where Ram is shown chasing the deer. I'll tell you something else about that. But before that, I tell, I let me tell you about color. Okay. I saw that the background of the whole painting is in what you call mustard yellow. Ah. Then I thought, why mustard? It is something to do with mustard. In other words, I would say that it is something to do with taste. Mm. Along with the vision, a taste is associated with color. So if you have a whole ground on which this play of Ram chasing the deer taking place, it's on a mustard ground. Uh. It's not a mustard field in a naturalistic sense, but the whole place is baked in mustard. 
Isn't it beautiful? I love well, it. I love mustard as and a color. So, so I, I love I said when that Rajasthan, <laughs> when all the mustard fields bloom, you know. So the, every color has either taste. Yeah. Every color has something to beyond vision, not just looking, but some other sense like uh, touch. Or it will have some other, you know, sensation. And I think it is that brings this painting into some kind of a what you call the paintings in that sense come to us in a multiple sensual ways. So each painting you discover over oh, here is that I would say that that red was very hard and very strong, something like a real red chili. If you have eaten the Bikaneri chili mm -hmm. <laughs> in Rajasthan, mm -hmm. I suppose you would know. Yeah, Ganpat yeah. smiling, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> so you may, you know, I'm not saying it's a, in a literal sense, but in a metaphoric sense. In, but people understand it, you know, if you say, itna, itna lal hai, ke hamari ko chupta hai. It's so red that it pricks my eyes. So similar to that, you know, you have these sensations. I love that so expression, painting. it's so red that it pricks your eyes. I want to talk a little bit about um, your kavads, because oh. kavads are very dear to my heart. I love kavads. I didn't know what they were until I came to Rajasthan, and Rakesh and I, our VJ, yeah, and I yeah, made yeah. sort of a quasi kavad called Dream of yeah, the yeah. Mirrors. Then later we tried to do some little small kavads and we went to the one little, what's the town's name, Basi? We went to Basi to buy some little kavads to paint up. We started painting them and they got eaten by termites before we were even finished. They were eaten. So we didn't buy the right type of kavad when we did that. But tell me about your kavad because it, especially the big one that I think you exhibited at Kiran Nader. Yeah. Can you talk about that at all? i just give you a little background that I saw the first coward in the Crafts Museum in Delhi. I had seen the small ones sold in the, you know, you know, craft shops. Yeah. But I saw one which was about, about three feet, a little over. And it, it, I was stuck by it and I said, what is this? It's like a house like a home, because it has doors. And yet it is not a house. Yes. It opens out on... It cannot be seen from one direction, you have to go around it. Because it opens in all directions. And it tells a story. Now how does it tell a story? It doesn't tell one story, it tells multiple stories. You know, there is a story of, let's say, suppose, one god or one goddess or there will be a deity inside, there will be some other stories. So like it is taken stories from the Puran or from the life of people or from the stories of, uh, you know, Rajasthan, you know, folklore. So that is how it stuck me. I said that this, this is up my lane. Well, I fell in love with them because to me they were magic boxes. Yes. They were just, they had all those little doors and, <laughs> oh, look, this opens too, this opens too. And then the way you can fold out the screen Absolutely. and display a large, I, I fell in love with them immediately. And I wanted so badly to work with them, but we haven't really done much of it. But that's why I admire your kavads. You've done some smaller kavads yeah. also, correct? I made about seven of them seven. earlier before okay. making the big one. Okay. The small ones were made, uh, you are right, absolutely, it's like a magic box. It's a magic box. I love, I love magic box. Even I like the idea of the magic box. And I thought this is something which you keep on opening all the time and keep on making combinations and permutations. So it's something which is continuous. It's not one view of looking at a, you know, a rectangular painting. But you keep open, and second thing is, is physical, because you open it with your own hands. And then you look at it and you say, ah, oh, this is not good, okay, let me look at it, let me look at it, let me turn around. Then you have to get up and look at it from other side. It's a continuous process. 
in a way. And even your large kavad, yeah. if I'm remembering right, you can walk inside yeah. of it. And there's actually a ceiling, which I think is full of clouds and pari yeah, yeah, on yeah. the ceiling. Oh, that's yeah, amazing. Right. I love that. So that's exactly what happened. I said that this is what I'm handling with my hands. But suppose if I want to use my whole body, I will have to make it big. Yeah. So I made it about, it's about, I think, seven to eight feet high. Mm. So you can walk into the coward. Coward is not something in which you can, it's not an object. It's something which surrounds you. So you get enveloped by this, whatever you call it, you know. Yeah. And then there are doors, you know, doors in all directions. Well, you enter the story. You actually sort of enter the narrative of the Kavad, you know. Yes, so I built my own narrative into that. I thought that I would make it slightly personalized. So, there are three parts in the middle of it. That it they are digital works. One is a, a boat scene, which I had borrowed from the work of Nayan Sukh. I just took the boat. Same dimension, but I blew it up of this size. Now, miniature painting is of this size, but that it was about five to six feet wide. And then I put other figures. So that was something like a, well, in every sense of the word, you can say it is an arc. Yeah. A sort of, a, all the time we are thinking of an arc, all the time we are thinking of going somewhere. All the time we want to pack up and go away. And there is always this world. What are the things that you would want to pack up? What is your world? Your house, your people, your friends, your this, your that. People you love, people who are also in history, whom you think they belong to you. You know, if you love, a poet like Kabir, you think that uh, that belongs to you, no? It's yeah, Kabir. Kabir is very important. Yeah, very you. important. So you can carry everything in an arc. The second thing I thought was of a tree. A tree as a, what you call, habitation. Mm. Not tree as a kind of a just a, what you call, a botanical object. But besides that, the tree can also house people. They can house. And so I began to introduce musicians, dancers, then monuments and other things. It's all part of the tree. See, it's a little world. I, I remember you made a sculpture. I saw a sculpture you made that was on a stick. It was like a lotus. And as you know what I'm talking about, it was very beautiful. It was a flower, but it was made out of wood and painted. Oh! Uh, do you remember that? <laughs> I don't know what brought that to my mind. No, no, this was a toy. It was a toy. You see, in the Fine Arts College where I was teaching, every year we used to have a fair. Oh yeah, the fair here in Baroda. So we make things which we normally don't. Okay. So I would play with wood and I thought that if I were to make a tree, what would I do? So I made six, seven, eight different parts of it. Then with a hinge, you know, we put it together. So that you can keep on playing with it. And I went on making this. I made some, about 10 or 12. They were all sold, okay, you know. Okay. But they, it was like it was nice. I thought you had painted it so beautifully. I it was painted so it by hand. Yes. Beautiful. It was just. Yeah, yeah. So I've got one. I'll show it to you. You yeah. show it to me. Um, and so it, this is running late. So I hate to cut these things short because this okay. is so fascinating. But there's one other question I want to ask, and that is, of course, you are married to Nalima Sheikh, who's yeah. another 
fabulous artist. I absolutely love her work. I'm in awe of both of you. You said at Gallery Arc one time, you said that it seemed like I was afraid to talk to you, and I am afraid to talk to you many <laughs> times because I sort of hold you both in extremely no, no, high no, no, esteem. No, just a little. But um, how is it living with another artist who's equally famous? Do you do you find that there's a good relationship there in your professional lives? No, no, we have uh, developed that professional relationship, you know, we, when I got married to an artist, I knew that, uh, you know, I must have something that I could share with her. Over the years, we have discovered that our interests are very close. Yeah. She loves Indian miniature painting as much as I do and she also wants to draw from it as much and if you may remember or if you do not, she has already written that she went to Nathadwara, work with Dwarkala. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This morning we were talking about it and I said yes we went there because there was a workshop here in Baroda which I had organized when I was teaching and we had brought Nathadwara painters in Baroda. But Nilima struck a chord with Dwarkala and she learned about Pichwai directly from him. Ah, okay. Now, for me, it's like, it's my extension. She is doing it for me also. Not only learning for herself. So in that sense, I suppose she would think that if I am wandering around Italy, somewhere in some corner of Piero della Francesca painting, and if I write to her, she would also feel equally elated. One of these days, I want to interview Nalima too. Not today, because sure. I don't want to wear you out and extend my welcome too much. But another day, I'll come back and we'll interview Nalima. And um, I think I should probably end this. But this has been a great honor, and thank you for sharing some of your thoughts and your history. and. Um, Welcome. I'm going to say goodbye, and after I say goodbye, then you have to say goodbye too. And everybody waves, okay? okay. So this is Wazwo X Wazwo, Evil O, coming to you live from the home of Gula Muhammad Sheikh and Nalima Sheikh in Baroda. Goodbye. Please like and subscribe. Goodbye. goodbye Please goodbye. like and subscribe. It helps. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>